Hello uh, and good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Akshay Patel. I'm one of the uh, neurosurgeons at Swedish uh, Neurosciences. And we, today we're going to go through our mock oral board review series. Um, I want to launch uh, the series again once with, with the new set of fellows. And I thought that today we would uh, talk about the oral boards in general and some tips going forward. These are just general tips for the oral mock uh, board review uh, series that uh, we will be going through throughout the year. We'll be picking a different fellow every um, uh, every month or every couple of weeks to go through a simulated um, mock oral board review type test. We will have invited uh, guest lecturers um, throughout the process. We will try to keep it as broad as possible involving both cranial and spine. And that way we can involve all the fellows uh, in it that we have at Swedish Medical Center, which uh, would be very useful for them to go through this process uh, before they uh, understand how to take uh, the boards and give them tips and, and tricks. This is a kind of interesting series because it kind of highlights uh, the things that would be asked on, on a testing uh, session, but also can help formulate their ideas and thoughts in general as fellows before they get into the world, uh, big wide world and try to make decisions on their own about certain cases and, and how to manage cases, how to think about cases uh, critically, and certainly how to come up with at least a simple plan uh, going forward. I hope that this also helps them with managing complications and that brings us to this topic today, which is uh, avoiding asteroids. Now I could have titled this avoiding complications, but you can't really avoid complications on the oral board review uh, or the oral boards. The, on the oral boards in both neuroscience uh, for, or for neurosurgery and orthopedics, you will get complications. So you can't avoid complications, but part of the testing is that you will uh, undergo a series of uh, cases that each will have a certain complication. And, and for de depending whether it's orthopedics or neurosurgery, um, each complication will, will get increasingly uh, more serious so that you, the, 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 t the testing or the examiners will want to know how you uh, manage those complications. It doesn't mean that uh, you are a bad surgeon, you made the wrong choices, but complications are part of the course uh, in our surgical specialty. And certainly uh, as the director of quality here at Swedish Medical Center for, neuros for neurosurgery, I understand that that uh, is a very real phenomenon even in the best of circumstances. So without further ado, uh, I wanted to uh, point out that you may think that uh, in, the exam, in, the ex in the exam that uh, you are uh, the target uh, and that you have a target on your back and they're gonna put you into a situation where you're gonna give them the wrong answer uh, and get totally crushed. These are some of my examiners here, um, Dr. Spetzler, Van Loveren, Friedlander, and Jack Morkos. And these guys were testing me throughout the exam. And you can imagine how nervous someone can be uh, knowing that these giants in their fields are, are giving you uh, a testing material. But in the end, they're not trying to uh, back you into a corner. They're not trying to catch you at, uh, at, a, at a simple error. What they're trying to do is seeing how you avoid the asteroids, avoid the uh, major pitfalls of dealing with complications. You'll get complications, but how you deal with them is what they're trying to test for. One of the biggest key pieces of advice is when you encounter a complication or encounter a case, do the surgery that you are trained to do. Do the surgery that you learned in residency, if it's been a while, do the, do, do the case that, run through the case, run through the steps that you did during your fellowship. Uh, I can't stress this enough. I think people, uh, you know, take this examination having read something, something interesting online or watching a YouTube video of how to do a, a procedure or approach to a procedure, whether it be spine, for example, uh, a costal transvasectomy if they've, if they've never seen one, or, you know, a skull-based approach if they've never seen one, uh, you know, in real life, I've been trained to do that and picking that as a course uh, of action during the test. That is very easy to tell uh, from the examiner's standpoint that the, that the, uh, the, the fellow, the resident who's going through the testing has not actually um, performed that kind of uh, procedure and it's easy to find yourself in a really rapid, you know, uh, cycle of, of, of messy uh, line of questioning from the examiners that would uh, put you in a really bad spot. And so always fall back on your laurels in through your training. That's very key. The big complication categories, uh, 
the, the easiest way to think about them is that there are pre-surgical uh, complications that will happen, you know, uh, that they make that the examiners may go through as you're talking about the case. There are surgical complications that will arise during the case, and uh, we'll, we'll tend to focus on those today, things that can happen in the operating room and that you have to manage right away. And there's a few post-surgical classic uh, complications that happen either from a medical standpoint or a surgical standpoint, but you have to manage in the intensive care unit typically. Uh, and as long as you know that that's the kind of general broad categories of boxes that, that that will organize your thinking and your thoughts about how to deal with each specific issue and each specific case. We always talk about the air industry and, and how they have helped met tremendously, especially when it comes to uh, checklists and going through this preparation of each uh, situation. I think it's very useful to think about in this in this examination as well. As you are studying, uh, as you are studying the cases, as you're studying the material for the examination, you always want to think about all the potential setup for each procedure. So it's it's well enough to know how to actually the procedure, but how to set up the issues with the procedure and going through a stepwise approach. If you have to write them down, write them down. Most textbooks don't don't think about uh, testing or most textbooks or material that we have uh, out there, such as Greenberg or our, or our neurosurgery texts and the orthopedic, uh, you know, review books don't actually, uh, you know, they prepare you for the written examination, but not necessarily for the oral board uh, examination. And that requires you to compress that knowledge, uh, organize it in a way that is, is a list format and go through steps of a procedure, uh, certain complications that may arise, uh, post-operative care, and certainly uh, thinking about um, how you would um, manage the complications if they do arise and, and the steps that you would take. Write them down, make a list, make a list for each specific topic, make a list for each specific case that may arise in your specific board review. At least for the uh, neurosurgery boards, uh, you have a choice of choosing a topic or a field of your expertise. You may choose general, and you may, and that may be all well and good, uh, or you may choose specifically vascular neurosurgery, uh, uh, functional neurosurgery, spine, uh, tumor or oncology, and or pediatrics. Now, even if you choose general, that doesn't mean that you just get a secondary general segment. The general, if you choose general uh, neurosurgery as your secondary subspecialty, they, the, the complexity of those cases will increase. They will be general cases, but the complexity itself will be much higher than the, the actual five, five questions that they want to ask you uh, in, the general, uh, in, the, in the regular general section. If you pick a sub, subspecialty like vascular or, or functional, uh, they will go through the standard uh, set of cases that you may uh, see uh, in your emergency room uh, and your practice if you're a busy uh, practitioner in that field. I will put this caveat in there for spine uh, as a subspecialty. Now, if you choose spine as your subspecialty, please note that you, I would recommend that you would be a fellowship trained spine individual. Uh, you may have a practice that you are generally doing a lot of spine, but you never had a spine fellowship and uh, you, you are a generalist, but you tend to do 90% of your cases spine. Picking spine as your subspecialty case uh, can be hazardous because that is the number one section that uh, uh, examinees fail on is the spine uh, subspecialty, subspecialty section. I just want to give that a uh, warning for people who are not necessarily fellowship trained that if they want to pick spine as a subspecialty, be very careful about it. Uh, it's where the highest number of failures happen. A little bit, a little bit about the exam. Uh, you, you're going to get in there. You're going to be nervous. You're going to be talking. You're going to be talking to other examinees right before you go in there. It's almost like uh, that movie Gladiator where they put you uh, where you're you're about to go. Com you know, you're about to go into the ring. Uh, Emperor Commodus is about to open the gates and you're about to run into the arena. Uh, it's a bit like that when you're in the examination, they have all the examinees in a room with, you know, refreshments all hanging out together before they open up the doors so that you can go to your specific assigned examination rooms. Uh, and certainly uh, I would try to encourage you to ignore the uh, outside noise uh, from that from that scenario. Uh, try to internalize uh, yourself and try to keep calm. 
when you do get into the examination, you are going to be slightly nervous. You, your heart rate is going to be slightly higher. Maybe your blood pressure is going to be slightly higher. Um, one, I'm, I recall when I took the exam, one examinee had a Fitbit and was trying to measure his blood pressure. I thought he was going to have a heart attack um, because of the vitals that he was getting through his Fitbit. But in any regards, um, when you get into the examination, it, it is uh, very tempting to stay quiet as much as possible. But my advice is to verbalize, 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 to keep uh, an open mind, keep your mouth moving, keep uh, your, your sentences clear and to, to the point. When you're marking a side and a site, you're going to have a model in front of you. Go ahead and mark left and right, if, you know, as or before the examination is even started, and that can help you not get the wrong uh, side. Uh, fake out the huddle or timeout. So, most physicians, if not all physicians in this country, have to have some form of form of timeout or huddle pre-procedurally, and so it's okay to verbalize that. It's okay to verbalize how you would do uh, at your home institution. At Swedish, you verbalize the side, the procedure, uh, the estimated blood loss, uh, any anticipated issues intraoperatively, and the, and the post-operative plan of ac action or, or destination, and, and any, specimens, any specimens that you may encounter. It's okay to go through that, uh, in, that in the same way and verbalize that same way, if the exam and, go, and get through it quickly. If the examina examiner no knows that you know what you're doing, they'll move you on to the next portion of the case. It's okay to fake that, uh, do or do a fake or, or a simulated huddle in that regard. Uh, point out that you use image guidance. You can always uh, suggest that for every case that you would use image guidance. If the examination, if the examiner or examinee, uh, if the examiner suggests that you don't have that facility, that's okay. As long as you mention that you are going to use it, uh, and that's the uh, typical thing. I believe that with uh, the evolution of brain lab and uh, stealth navigation for uh, intraoperative imaging and the now burgeoning uh, field of using uh, robotics intraoperatively as well as image guidance for spine surgery. I think it's okay to mention these things. Uh, that is the modern way of, of way we're training our, our, our next generation of neurosurgeons, orthopedic neurosurgeons, uh, sorry, orthopedic surgeons. And so that is okay to mention. Uh, spine, the spine section, as I said, is a little bit is always a little bit tougher than the, in, in my opinion, in terms of the responses that we've had in, in the last several years uh, from uh, examiner examinees who've taken the test and have given feedback. Um, spine has been a, a little bit uh, trickier than most. Um, spine is special because they often will have patients that have multiple lesions or, or lesions that are uh, not contiguous in the spine. For example, a cervical lesion and a, and a lumbar lesion in the same patient. And you have to work through those uh, issues and work through the diagnosis. Uh, you have transitional and an anatomy issues and it's not uncommon for the examiners to use that to their advantage. And uh, especially in the lumbar spine and in terms of counting, asking which levels that you would operate on. Uh, it's okay, Al although you may not generally routinely use this uh, because you have good intraoperative imaging or you use the uh, imaging in, ter in terms of intraoperative CT, but if that's not available to you, uh, please uh, suggest, for example, for thoracic surgery that you would use some kind of preoperative level marking, whether that's a, a vascular surgeon, uh, you know, using coils, uh, the interventional radiologist putting a pin, uh, whether it's your pain specialist or your um, minimally interventional uh, radiologist doing a kyphoplasty um, or a vertebroplasty to mark those levels, please use that. Intraoperative CT, as I said, is a burgeoning uh, co uh, concept and certainly would be tested uh, if, if you know and how to use it, making sure that you get the uh, right side uh, and the right level uh, to help you with that. Now, I think that uh, we talked about uh, the three phases of, uh, of where you are going to get uh, complications. I wanted to go through a few of the medical issues that you might get postoperatively. And when you do get your board certificate, uh, especially for neurosurgery, on that board certificate that said that you're board, a board certified neurosurgeon, it says there on that, on that piece of certificate that you are fully trained uh, in the management of neurocritical care patients. And so, to that extent, there has been a trend in the last three years uh, that the examinees will ask at least one portion, at least one little thing about how to manage a neurocritical care patient. And typically that uh, surrounds a medical issue that you may encounter with that patient 
pre or post operatively in the intensive care unit. And some of the major issues I've listed here uh, that, that can be an issue uh, and that can obviously cause uh, problems with your patient, but that you need to recognize the, more, the most important portion of the getting the points for that neurocritical care portion of how to manage a patient is to recognize the problem. The manager of the problem can vary a little bit from patient to patient, but the recognition is, is, is one point or a set of points that you'll get for that examination. For example, DVTPE is recognizing that, uh, that that is happening to your patient and try to figure out when to start prophylaxis. For pneumonia and ARDS, I've had questions and I've had examinees give me feedback of questions about just looking at a basic, a basic x-ray and recognizing something wrong is happening, whether it's a consolidated lung, presence of ARDS, something obvious, a mass in the lung. I've had the situation where uh, an examiner has just put up the VQ mismatch at the bottom of the screen. The, the x-ray looks okay. Uh, and that has to cue you off that something is going on. Knowing how to read the basic EKG and recognizing for ST elevations, just like your ACLS protocol, you should be comfortable with that. And the management of sepsis and shock, you should be able to at least differentiate neurogenic shock from septic shock and cardiogenic shock. It's very important to recognize this, especially for the vascular neurosurgeons who are doing the vascular accession and managing those patients after a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a major um, vascular uh, you know, hemorrhage issue. The metabolic components are the most commonly asked questions on the boards. It doesn't matter wh wh whether you're a spine, uh, you know, or, or a spine a spine section person, or a, or a tumor person, or a vascular person, or even a functional person. That is a very common question, and the most common question regarding that is how to manage sodium. The neurocritical care portion of how they test you is just how to manage sodium in patients and managing hyponatremia versus hypernatremia uh, and how to differentiate uh, some of the more common uh, disease scenarios uh, or pathogenesis, whether, whether it's DI, SIDH, or cerebral salt wasting. And this kind of uh, table that I have here goes down to the basics that everyone should know. This is the kind of stuff that you should know, you know, going through residency and managing patients that have complicated issues. Managing the issues between uh, SIDH and, and cerebral salt wasting, you know, the, you know, the volume status high or low, whether you restrict sodium intake, whether you continue to provide normal saline, whether you test for uh, urine uh, osms, managing basic DI, the use of DDAVP, how to give that, uh, and typically nowadays intranasally, for example, knowing the doses of that, uh, it's very important. I didn't put that, any of that information there, but it's very, it, it's not uncommon for examiners to ask for dosing and uh, when to prepare a patient for that, whether it's mild DI, complete DI. These are all things that you want to ha have in your back of your mind because they will ask you about the drugs that are involved. They will ask you about how you would typically manage these patients post-op. And you know, if you're doing cranial neurosurgery, uh, it's not uncommon for you to deal with this in your practice anyway uh, with these patients. Uh, but I think sodium management is very key. I would I haven't added a slide for this, but on top of sodium management, and this goes for the spine, uh, the spine section, managing uh, hypo, hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia uh, is another topic that's uh, very commonly asked. The management of, of hyperglycemia can, can coincide or correlate with outcomes and certainly with spine surgery, you want to make sure that that is something that you uh, have some uh, form of mastery on but it, because these, these questions happen consistently. And it doesn't matter what, like I mentioned, it doesn't matter what field you're in, if you know how to manage sodium, uh, that will get you a lot of uh, points uh, going forward through the, through the examination. One point I wanted to make is that, and, the, and one, point, one, one thing that is not ever seen in textbooks is the manager of your time. Now, in the examination, and this again refers to the neurosurgery boards, uh, whether you're a DO or an MD, uh, you want to get through at least four to five cases per hour. That translates to about seven to 10 minutes, at most 15 minutes per case. Now, getting through those cases, you think that's gonna be straightforward, but in the end, if you get through um, 
a case and you're floundering with the asteroid and the asteroid's about to strike, you will know this midway through your case and you want to be able to salvage that situation. Now, tri tips and tricks about how to manage that time, and no one tells you this, is obviously practice. You want to go to a review course, and we'll, 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 we'll be that review course for, that, for, for SNI and for the audience out there. And that's why you need to practice, 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 getting through cases within that 10 to 15 minute range. That's the only way that this is gonna help you get through this examination and make sure that you're successful. And going forward, like I mentioned earlier in this talk, uh, uh, we're gonna use uh, our resources here to get uh, through those cases and get through uh, our fellows and continually test them throughout the year over different topics, making sure that they have that practice. Certain things that will help you is when you given a case, talk through the case, verbalize, verbalize, verbalize. We'll give you, a, the, the examiners will give you a screen, go through a 68 year old patient with a certain condition, past medical history is this, and present to the emergency room with this. Verbalize all those things that are on that slide. Ask for any additional data. If you don't ask, they won't give it to you. Ask about the exam, ask about past medical history, ask about uh, things that you are pertinent to the case that are important. Uh, you don't need to get too lavish in your line of questioning if it if it's if you know it's leading to just a, a answers that it doesn't matter or it, you know it's uh, um, perfunctory in in the amount of data that that the, that the examiners give you. Talk through the case, verbalize it. That will get you through each slide and will kind of give you a sense of timing. Describe the only time you slow down is when you're describing the imaging and describing again verbalize the imaging. They might give you an MRI scan. Is it T1? Is it T2? Is it contrast uh, weighted? They may give you an angiogram. What side are we looking at? What, what, what vessel are they imaging? They give you a CT scan of the spine. Uh, describe the levels, count the levels. You can actually, with your finger, point uh, and count the levels on the screen. If, if you, if, if you, and if you do that, and if you're making a mistake, you can correct yourself in real time, or the examiners may mention an anatomic, may give you the, the anatomic variant because they, you, you pointed it out. It's okay to use your fingers and, and, and point to different things on the screen. You don't have to sit back uh, being scared of the examiners. The screen's gonna be very close to you when you do this exam. Now, that's the only time you slow down, but you can, you can use that. Uh, what I meant by uh, cadence is, uh, is, is, that, is that timing that I mentioned, you wanna get through the cases, uh, and ideally five cases within the hour. Uh, when it comes to time warping, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in, the, in this lecture, is that you want to uh, understand that if you forgot to say something at the beginning of the case, for example, um, you're doing a, uh, a brain surgery and you um, are, are talking about you know, a neuromonitoring later in the case and you'd be like, I would have put leads in earlier at the beginning of the case. You may remember something later during the procedure and you can always mention, well, I would have had uh, the patient have a central line in. And you can actually jump back as long as you don't break your line of um, talking or your ability to talk again verbalize getting through uh, your syntax in a very thoughtful way you can always go back to the oh but by the way i should have mentioned i would have done this it's okay to warp or bend times to your advantage and mention things that will help you i like to think of things in very concrete in concrete ways, and I will say this, uh, there are only about nine complications, certain complications that you will get, whether they're in intraoperative or postoperative, nine big boxes. And you have to master these nine big boxes that I've listed here, seizures, air embolism, uh, malignant cerebral edema, intraoperatively, uh, hematoma, intraoperative or postoperatively, vasospasm, which you can get even in, in any surgery, in any, in any, in any setting, hydrocephalus, tension pneumocephalus, CSF fistulas, whether they're spine or cranial, and for the cranial people, uh, inverse cerebral herniation. Th that's, you know, if you listed the only complications, there's only so much they can ask you. If you master each of these issues, and there's only nine, and master how to manage these problems, you have done 90% of the work. You've done 90% of 
uh, the ability to prepare for for, for this cert, for this examination. It, you might not be the expert on how to take out a brainstem cavernova. You might have only seen that or done that once with an attending either in fellowship or residency. But if you can get through these complications and understand these complications, you'll you're going to do well regardless. And we're going to go through some of these complications in detail, managing uh, which ones are important. The other complications are specific to certain fields of neurosurgery, and we'll go through them later in the year uh, as we get the examinees or our fellows coming through and doing an hour with us every other Wednesday. The most common thing that you should have down cold, whether it's cranial or spine, is the management of seizures. Now, you can use your own protocol. I would recommend, like I have on this slide, using the American Society of Epilepsy as a template. You can use Greenberg as a template, but in any event, you need in your mind a rapid, cold, uh, stone way of managing status epilepticus. Status epilepticus can happen in any setting, in any patient, in any, in any fashion, depending, it doesn't matter of the diagnosis. And it's, it is a, you may think it's a neurological issue, but but it is the, one of the most common places where examinees, examiners ask and examinees fail because in their mind they don't have a protocol. Certainly, I didn't mention this at the beginning of the, the top of the slide, but when someone has seizures and is in status, ABCs, think about airway, breathing, circulation right away first. Your ACLS protocol trumps all of the management off of that. Once the examiners know that you know how to manage those things, they will ask you about how to manage this seizure as it's actively happening and how to manage epile status epilepticus in an in a organized and stepwise fashion. As you can see, there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of or, 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 ors on this slide because there are many ways to manage status epilepticus. You just have to pick one and you have to pick a way of doing it. They're not going to, uh, they're not going to say, well, I would have used phenobarbital versus you know, Kepra versus something else. You just have to have in your mind, your own protocol. Each examinee is gonna have a different protocol uh, and it's okay. As long as the examiners know that you know how to manage this disease process, they will keep it moving. If you stumble, if you do not have a organized fashion of how to deal with status epilepticus, then you will inevitably find yourself facing that asteroid uh, uh, oncoming in a big and large way and it won't be easy to get yourself out of that situation certainly you can always ask uh, the examiner that you would you would call neurology uh, and ask for their advice uh, but in the meantime uh, they may say the neurologist is out of town not available uh, you have to figure out a way to remember uh, some of the things on this slide it, it, one of the few things you really have to truly memorize before going to the exam the other one that you see intraoperatively, it's a very common question, especially for cranial neurosurgery, uh, but can happen for a spine surgery. In fact, you know, if you're doing a, an occipital fusion uh, on a patient, I've seen examiners ask about, you know, the occipital cervical fusion air embolism uh, situation uh, as you're dealing with, uh, you know, bony sinuses or, or sinuses within the bone. Things to recognize is a drop in the end title uh, CO2. Uh, and they may give you a, a, a basically they, they may give you something like this where the anesthesiologists have their tracking board and they're like well what do you see now I've highlighted and circled a few things they may they're not going to do that uh, they're going to just give this to you and you have to recognize that certain things something bad is happening there is a change happening uh, air embolism uh, is one of the more uh, easy ways for an examiner to test your knowledge of the, of the disease process and what to do in a not uncommon um, complication, especially in cranial neurosurgery when the patient's in a sitting position or a, a high head position, um, and in spine surgery when dealing with, with the occipital region and dissecting and drilling bone in that region. Steps to take when that happens, and all you have to do is memorize these couple of things and just blurt them out, verbalize. You're going to flood the field, you're going to put a sponge down, you're going to drop the head below the heart, you're going to use the Durant maneuver, although there's limited success depending on how how the patient is positioned, but left level decubitus is positioned to get the air out of the right atrium. Uh, the in, uh, increase in inspiratory oxygen, which the anesthesiologist will do for you. And, you know, you can always mention, although you did, might have not mentioned the beginning, of the, the beginning of the procedure, that you would have had a central line placed by the, by the, by the anesthesiologist that you could aspirate 
uh, air uh, that had been trapped in the heart uh, through a central venous line. These are all things that, like I said, that you can mention in the management that you may have not explicitly mentioned at the beginning of the case when they ask you, okay, well, how do you set up the case? How do you position the patient? Uh, you might have forgotten to mention central line. Um, you might have forgot to mention uh, certain other things that you may have been useful to you, like a precordial Doppler. Just mention that, oh, by the way, I would have used that. And oh, by the way, uh, never say I forgot to mention it. Just say that you would have used it. And that basically puts the examiner in a spot where they can't really not take away points of uh, the fact that you had bent time to the middle or beginning of the case. The other, most, the other very common intraoperative complication is milling stream edema and how to deal with that. Um, again, you should have a, a list called in your mind and mention all the things on that list when something is happening like brain herniation in front of you. The brain is herniating from the wound. Uh, it is mushrooming, mushrooming out of the uh, confines of the skull and after the craniotomy. What are you gonna do? And they want to know that you have a plan of action, an immediate plan of action at your fingertips. They don't want to have you you know, flounder, uh, if you're floundering through this they, in, in an examination, uh, in, exa in a setting of an examination, they're worried that they're going to flounder when, when it comes to real life. Have all these steps, raise the head of the bed, ask for, uh, you know, steroids, ask for mannitol, ask for hypertonic saline. You may have already mentioned all these things before, but they just want to make sure that you verbalize these things and make sure that in a real life setting that you know that these are tools that you have available to you immediately. Um, the anesthesiologist, talk to them, deep in the sedation, temporarily hyperventilate the patient. Uh, if you have to, and they and they will continue to say, well, you did all these steps, the brain still can't, still uh, herniating out, uh, doing a temporal obectomy, uh, for uh, certain hemispheres to kind of give you more room. If, the, if there's a hematoma present and you're doing this for a interstitial hemorrhage decompression, uh, evacuate the hematoma. Use ultrasound to locate the hematoma before you evacuate it. These were all, are all things that they want to know that you're thinking about actively when there's a problem. You know, time is brain and this thing is herniating it out and you're, gonna about the, you're about to get to the point where the, of no return and you can't do anything. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid release is very important. Uh, you know, you could have meant you, you could you, see, you could have, you can always warp time and say I would have had a um, external ventricular drain placed at the beginning of the case. I would have had a lumbar drain placed at the beginning of the case. I would have had a, a EVD uh, ready and available. If if you uh, are slick, you might even mention pain's point, which is an equilateral triangle uh, using the sphenoid ridge. Uh, as and, and the frontal lobe as a location to perpendicularly enter the uh, lateral ventricle and, and release cerebral spinal fluid. Obviously, you know exactly how to get to pain's point if you're going to mention it. And I have a little diagram here in, in the slide. But having done this before, you want to know that if you uh, pick a gyrus in the frontal lobe, either a middle, likely middle uh, frontal gyrus, that you can get into the ventricle if you go perpendicular uh, to the brain matter. Um, and that can be a, an easy way to immediately re release fluid. Now, or no, release intracranial pressure. Uh, now, for the specific uh, vascular surgeons in the room, uh, or the vascular surgeons who are going to be taking this case, you may want to, and you may have forgotten about adenosine uh, for intraoperative aneurysm rupture. You can warp time again and mention, oh, we, I would have had adenosine available at the beginning of the case in case something happened, in case there was, there was an intraoperative rupture and I needed to stop the heart or rapidly slow down the heart so that I could get control of the aneurysm uh, if it ruptured intraoperatively. These are all things that you want to have ready at your fingertips, making sure that you know that each of the steps are going to, and, and beyond this, you know, if the examiner is still telling you that there is a problem, you have to either think about your, about the case critically, if, you know, stepping, taking a step back and making sure that you have the diagnosis correct, or, uh, you know, you continue mentioning other things that you may still do, uh, whether or not it's, um, uh, whether or not it's more extreme as, as, as the level of complexity goes. They may give you a, a reprieve. They, this may be the final question of, uh, at, the, at the end of the hour, and they're just trying to see how you would uh, respond to pressure. But in general, you don't want them to continue pushing you if this is your first case. You're missing something if this is your first case. If it's your final case, if this is the fifth case, they're just asking, they're just trying to see what else, what other things you can do. A funny thing an examiner said to me, and I'll mention that, I'll mention this, 
a couple of years ago was that uh, sometimes they ask questions just to uh, figure out what what you would have done because they don't know that they want to see what interesting things they can learn from examinees, new techniques, new ways of managing issues, or new ways of diagnosing things on on, a, on an MRI scan. Uh, they, they may not have all the answers either, uh, but it's, it's certainly if you're doing really well and progressing through cases, it's often in the final case, they're just uh, spitballing and asking uh, questions that have nothing to do with SLA examination and, and your points, you've got all the points you need. They just want to see uh, how you deal with certain situations that they, they're very uncomfortable have never seen before. The postoperative hematoma is one of the, uh, it is probably, you're going to get a postoperative hematoma. It's almost a guarantee, whether it's spine or um, cranial, you're going to get a postoperative hematoma. It is so common. It happens even in the best of circumstances and the best surgery possible, whether it's, and it doesn't matter the diagnosis, a postoperative hematoma is so common practice in, in both neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery, uh, whether it's spinal cranial, you're going to get that as a complication. It doesn't matter what case uh, setting. Uh, obviously, types of uh, hematoma, intracerebral, epidural, subdural, and subarachnoid. Subarachnoid, they will even test you test you on that management, even if you're doing a general neurosurgery section or even uh, the um, uh, tumor section, for example, they'll ask you about the management of subarachnoid patients. Uh, for spine cases, uh, epidural uh, hematomas are very common, um, uh, uh, commonly asked questions on how to, man man how to diagnose those. You know, you want, as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, the recognition of a problem is half the battle. The other half the battle is the tactics that you would use to, to manage these patients. Certainly imaging helps, you know, getting, knowing something is wrong and, and imaging helps, but you want to make sure that you mention that you did all the things preoperatively, warp time if you have to, that you would have controlled the three A's, the three most common A's in your patient, the, you know, patients on antiplatelets, patients anticoagulation, alcoholics. Certainly you might've forgotten way back on that first slide, the patient mentioned that they were on Plavix for X, Y, and Z uh, disease, and you forgot that, that that was an issue. You certainly can go back in time if you can recall it, um, and but just make sure that your patient is optimized before surgery. It's, I can't, uh, I can't uh, stress enough that it's it's very common to kind of tumble into that phase of I want to get through the case and I want to get through the operation and forget something as simple as uh, did I check the blood work? Did I check whether or not the patient is on, on any medications that would make this difficult? Intraoperatively, everyone knows that most uh, orthopedic and neurosurgeons are going to be diligent in their hemostasis, whether that's use of hemostatic agents, uh, and you can mention them, although each company has something different, use of Surgicel, gel foam, uh, uh, flow seal, or gel flow, whatever you use, um, and uh, the use of uh, Fribilar, Abitine. So long as you have these things that you know that you have these things available and that you verbalize that you, are, you would use these things. The use of dural tack-ups in trauma cases is very important. Although you may not use dural tack-ups in, in, in your trauma cases, you I would say that this is one of the few things that you'd routinely mention that you're using dural tenting uh, or as, a, as a technique to make sure they don't have a postoperative hematoma. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that examiners love to ask about. Uh, and especially in the setting of trauma, uh, a reason to return to surgery or return to OR. You may not do this also, uh, but using a Valsalva maneuver at the end of surgery to make sure, make sure that there's no active hemorrhage uh, happening in the in a tumor bed, for example. Um, and just you just have to mention it, although you may not, you routinely use it. I think that by mentioning that you're thinking about these intraoperative maneuvers to ensure that you're not having a problem uh, postoperatively of bleeding. Now, I had mentioned earlier in the talk that ICU care is, is a, a neurocritical care is a portion of what you're going to be tested on. You just have to mention some of these things. Uh, and as you get through, as you get better and better about thinking stuff, you can head off questions before they before the examiner has the time to ask them. If you just kind of blurt out very quickly that you're going to manage hypertension in the ICU, you're going to use ICP monitoring, you're going to use post-op CT monitoring, and you're going to keep the patient's data until the post-op CT is done, and then you're going to expect the patient carefully uh, in, in, an ICU can, in an ICU setting. Just say that in a very clear and concise fashion, uh, and the examiner is going to just take, take a step back and be like, okay, uh, either this guy has pressured speech and he's bipolar, uh, or he knows what he's doing. And certainly, once you have these things down cold and you're going to get through a case, they will uh, be very, very forgiving, understanding that you're completely prepared for this examination. 
the other, and we'll, we'll end with this, uh, the other most complicated, uh, well, this or the other most common complication that is asked in almost a guarantee, uh, whether it's, again, whether it's spinal cranial, is, is the manager of cerebral spinal fluid leak and the remainder of cerebral spinal fluid uh, fistulas. Uh, very commonly in post, uh, posterior fossa surgery, uh, you will get a situation where there is wound breakdown, a leakage of cerebral spinal fluid. What do you do? You need to have a board uh, answer, a board answer for that problem. Unfortunately, it is, it, is, it is a little bit of protocol, but you know there are issues where you can't avoid and patients will have cerebral spinal fluid leaks, even in the best, uh, most meticulous surgical uh, closure. You, can, you could have mentioned that you did X, Y, and Z for a watertight closure, use of uh, uh, you know, glues or, or, or static agents, uh, use of uh, you know, tying the dura completely closed, use of you know, bone, uh, hydroset, or cement, use of mesh. You could, have, you could have said all those things, but you will get a serious spinal fluid leak regardless of that. How to manage that? You know, you want, the first thing in the, in the, the, that I want to least listen to is that you've examined the patient, you've recognized this is cerebral spinal fluid or a wound issue, that you are willing to take the patient back to revo, re, revise, revise their wound to ensure that there's no issues, and that you've considered uh, cerebral spinal fluid diversion in cases of patients who are uh, refractory from uh, cerebral spinal fluid leak, whether they have obstruction or elevated intracranial pressure, you, you've thought about it and you've really thought about the use of a lumbar drain temporarily to manage that issue. You almost just want to say that you've said and you've thought about all these things uh, before going further. In spine surgery, similarly, cerebral spinal fluid leak is a very commonly asked question, especially in the general neurosurgery section, and you want to have uh, the right steps involved. Never be afraid of taking the patient back to surgery to redo the wound. Uh, you don't want to. You don't want to try to avoid that situation. They want to know that you thought about it. They want to know that you've uh, you you in your mind you know the right way to uh, fix a CSF tear, a dural tear uh, in the spine, and they want to also know that you have thought about um, more aggressive measures uh, for the treatment of cerebral spinal fluid leak. They're not going to get more complicated than that. They're not going to get into the weeds about, about those issues. Now with that, I'm going to finish this lecture. Uh, it was brief, but I wanted to go through some of the big, you know, categories of how to think about uh, the boards as you get through. Uh, this is a kind of a lecture to also launch the series or relaunch the series for this 2020-2021 uh, year uh, with our fellows. And we will start inviting fellows every other week uh, on Wednesday uh, intimately throughout the year. Uh, we might not have a fellow every week uh, because I would like to go through some didactic sessions uh, with other attendings or myself just to review uh, the more commonly uh, seen things that I've uh, noticed in the examination and prepare you for this examination in a way, in an organized way in your mind. With that, I will end this lecture. Thank you very much for listening. And I, I think Dr. Lifax on the panel, Dr. Monteith might be on the panel as well. I appreciate if they had any, any other additional things to think about, um, but we'll stop there. Thank you, Akshal. It's uh, Zach with that. Can you hear me okay? Yep. So I think that was an outstanding uh, overview of how to think about it and how to prepare for complications, which are definitely going to happen. Philosophically, um, the conversations I've had with board examiners the two things that they care about most in terms of people passing or failing the boards one is uh like you said maintaining organized thought in stressful situations and so some of the things that they throw at you are intentional to try to knock you off your game so to speak and and make you feel uncomfortable um, as neurosurgeons and, and surgeons of any kind we should be used to that um, but they want to see how people react and and inevitably one of the things that is a rapid fail on the exam are people who can't maintain organized thought in a stressful situation. The other and more important thing is safety, right? They don't necessarily care that everybody graduating is a yes or yell level surgeon. They want to know that everybody who is board certified is safe and understands how to uh, recognize and manage situations and also knows their own limitations. Um, and so one of the other things I would encourage 
uh, the audience to keep in mind is to verbalize out loud, you know, this is a procedure that I don't normally do, but faced with this situation, this is what I would do to manage it. And setting yourself up that way and sort of giving yourself the benefit of the doubt is very important. So uh, I think keeping those two things in mind that they wanna maintain uh, safety and they wanna maintain uh, organization in, in the face of chaos uh, is what separates people who pass from people who fail. And the rest is just gravy. And whether you do super well on the boards or you do just well enough, you're still board certified. Um, as far as safety goes, um, you sort of mentioned this, and again, I would encourage people to start thinking about how to verbalize this. Um, but the more you do to set yourself up for success, the, in terms of safety of the procedure, uh, the more likely they are to not necessarily back you into a corner. And so it's silly things like upfront saying that you give antibiotics and seizure prophylaxis at the beginning of a case. Uh, if you don't do that, they will notice, and later on, they will give you a infection wound breakdown complication, or they will give you a postoperative or an intraoperative seizure. But if you did those things, then, then it's hard for them to justify saying that that's a complication. You know, air embolism, if you know you're operating in a risky position and saying you're going to put a precordial Doppler on, you may not have to interpret the anesthesia readout because they may say that the precordial Doppler shows, you know, concern for air embolism. What are you going to do? So setting yourself up for success, setting yourself up with redundancy, you know, if, even if you don't use ultrasound on every case, having ultrasound available to compensate for your navigation going down because inevitably they will tell you that navigation failed to register, navigation clunks out in the middle of the case, and now how are you going to find the lesion? Yeah, thank you, Zach. Those are all very good points. I, I you know, I think I can't agree more about the safety and uh, preparedness uh, issue. If you're prepared for uh, the inevitable uh, complications as you see them. Uh, it's very hard for the examiners uh, to uh, get too into the weeds about each complication. Um, and like you mentioned, safety is important. They want to make sure that you're going to be a safe orthopedic or, or neurosurgeon. And so in that, in that regard, you want to, uh, like I mentioned, go through this in an organized fashion in your mind uh, and make sure you verbalize everything that all the tools are available to you. Um, I appreciate that input. I think it's very useful. Uh, Megan, I think we're done with the talk, unless there's any questions from our audience, which I can't see right now, but uh, we'll end there.